you guys have heard of the little small town of Locke here in the River Delta? So how many of you guys have visited the small little town of Locke? You live there? Okay, so maybe you can share a little bit more about Locke after Mr. Douglas is all dead. So he's going to talk a little bit about, um, you know, how the Chinese um, have been a part of our River Delta. And in addition to this, um, he's also going to talk a little bit about the history of how the small little town of Locke became a part of our River Delta. Okay? So please welcome Mr. Thank you. Douglas. Hi, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Yeah. Well, uh, my name is Douglas Chia, and uh, thank you for your introduction. And um, I'm a member of the Locke Foundation, and uh, in case that you're curious whether I'm a native in the Delta, and the answer is no. I'm not a native, but uh, I came here four years ago, and it's such a beautiful country, and I fell in love with it. So I'm here to, ready to share my knowledge of the Chinese in the Delta with you today. And um, uh, before we go into the Chinese in the Delta, maybe I will go into the uh, Chinese history so that you know the country where they come from. And the uh, Chinese call themselves Middle Kingdom because they thought they were the center of the universe. And they were inward looking and for them, the world is China. And sometimes, we are a little bit like this in America, because we have the World Series. And um, the Chinese history, written history, dates back to 1600 BC. So, uh, comes up to today is about 3,600 years. And uh, for your reference, the Roman Empire was founded in 27 BC. The Chinese history, they go down chronologically by dynasty. And each dynasty is last about 100 to 300 years. And um, the, the, the word dynasty is defined as the same ruler of the same family name uh, in the ruling. And that does not apply to the British system because the British monarchy, they do not go by their family name. You have Queen Elizabeth II, you have George V. So basically, uh, the, you cannot apply the dynasty's concept to uh, Britain, and, but this is what you think. Okay, so it's the same family ruler, they rule for 100 to 300 years, and for whatever reason, and you so it's taken over by another dynasty. Well, uh, there are 24 dynasties, like I said. So uh, I'm not going to go through 24 dynasties with you today because I don't want to scare you away. I just go with uh, the Qing dynasty. Qing is uh, 221 BC. And uh, you are probably familiar with this dynasty because they are the one responsible to build the terracotta soldiers and the Great Wall. Everybody knows about the Great Wall. And uh, besides that, their, their achievement also includes uh, they were the one who united all the little kingdoms in China into one united power. And uh, they also consolidate the language, the measurement system, which is important because <clears throat> even though today uh, many Chinese speak, speak different dialects, but the written language is always the same. And that is uh, attributed to the Qing Dynasty effort. And they are also famous for their tyrannical governing. Uh, they, uh, they were pretty cruel and brutal, and then, and then they, you know, they enslaved many people to build the Great Wall because if you have to pay the minimum wage, I don't think they could have afforded it. And from 221 BC, I jumped to the 1300s AD, and this is the Ming Dynasty, 
and Ming Dynasty runs parallel with the Renaissance in Europe. So you can see that the, the Europe and China and the Renaissance, Ming Dynasty, and technologically they're also pretty much on path. And the Ming Dynasty, their furniture and vases were very sought after in the antique market because of their workmanship and quality. So um, uh, many collectors are into Ming vase and furniture. And another story about the Ming Dynasty is uh, you might have heard of it from a history channel. Last year, they were celebrating the 500 years anniversary of the Admiral Zheng He, his fleet took the uh, took the fleet to Arabia and f as far west as the eastern coast of Africa. And that was the China's first effort to introduce China to the outside world, and, in, and they brought outside world into China. All right, so moving from, Qi, from Ming Dynasty, we go to Qing Dynasty. Okay, Qing Dynasty, Qing, uh, the people of Manchuria. They were the nomads north of the Great Wall. So they invaded China, they beat Maine, and they conquered, and they moved themselves into China and took over the capital of the Ming Dynasty and stayed there and ruled China from there. And they, uh, they were also pretty brutal and uh, they want all the Chinese men to be groomed the way they are. They made all the Chinese men to wear the long queue, the braid on their back, because they want Chinese to assimilate to them. And if the Chinese man fail, he would be punished by death. So that's pretty brutal. And that also explains that why Chinese who came, even they came to America, they still keep the queue. Because if without the queue, they could not go back to China. Well, the Qing Dynasty, they are not very good governors. And they were the ones who are blamed for letting China falling behind the Western power in technology and military. And uh, they, were, uh, they were very much uh, bullied by the Western power. They make the, the, they make the regime give up uh, trading ports. And uh, they were made to allow the Chinese people to become opium addict by the British. And then uh, they ceded Hong Kong to the British. So this is the thing that they didn't do well. And uh, uh, the Qing Dynasty is also the same period that we have the Gold Rush and the Transcontinental Railroad building. Now because of the weak governing, they have civil unrest, famine, and it's a very poor condition, and under that regime, people from China, they came out to America to, uh, to, to, to make money so that they can, they can send money back to home for, to feed the families. And this regime, they lasted until 1912. And they were overthrown by the revolutionaries. And the, these revolutionaries, they were also partially financed by the Chinese laborer in the Delta here. Okay, so you see there's a nice uh, relationship between chi Chinese history and American history. So, uh, from which part of China did these people came from? Well, just to show you, well, this is the southern tip of China. It's called the 
Pearl River Delta. And this is where they come from. And this, and Beijing is here. So they are 1,300 miles apart. And uh, it's a little bit like Italy. Lots of immigrants are coming from Sicily, which is the southern part, southern tip of Italy. Well, um, so during that time, uh, we have the 1848, the gold rush, and the Chinese people, men, predominantly men, uh, they came here, they came to look for gold just like everybody else did, and they had initial success. However, you know, they were later faced up a lot of challenges because of the racial tension. And then in 1950, when California became a free state, and they start talking about building a transcontinental railroad. And uh, when the Civil War broke out, and the Lincoln administration was, um, they, they really wanted to uh, build a railroad to California quickly because they want to make sure that California <laughs> stayed on the Union side. So they want to build quickly, and that means they need to, they need the speed. They need the speed, that means they need the laborers. And there weren't enough laborers then, so they looked to China. And the leader staff said, if these people, they can build the Great Wall, they can build the railroad. So uh, recruitment was uh, done in China, and uh, like I said previously, because of the poor condition of China, these people were happy to uh, join the labor force and came over here. So in 19, even as early as 1962, California, they were beginning to acquire the swamp land in the Delta because they saw the potential of the reclamation and which can turn the land into some rich agricultural land. And when the Chinese finished building the railroad, so they were recruited to come here to uh, drain, the, drain the canal and build the levee system. Even though that uh, in those days, uh, because uh, malaria was brought in by the fur tra trapper, and these poor souls, they have to toil away in the malaria infested water. They however built, they however built 13,000 miles of levee, and, uh, and we claim 250,000 acres of land. And uh, the value of the land before the reclamation was one to three dollars per acre. And after the reclamation, the land was worth 20 to 100 dollars an acre. So there's a lot of increase in value. Okay, so after they built the levee, and they, the Chinese stay on, they to work on the farm as um, farm laborers. And uh, some progressive ones, they were able to uh, move, up, move themselves up to a tenant farmer. Tenant farmer means that they are able to uh, rent, the lease the land from the landlord, the old landowner, and so they can, they can farm on their own just pay the rent. As you may know that uh, Chinese were not allowed to own land at the time because of the, uh, the legislature at the time. And uh, that also explains why that lock was built on this land. Okay, so many of you may, uh, haven't been there, so it's a good, good chance that uh, you can go visit Lot uh, because on the Saturday, 16th of February, there will be a Chinese New Year celebration. So it would be nice for you to go. 
Anyway, uh, to go back to the topic, um, at the height of the, uh, the anti-Chinese sentiment, um, there was 75% uh, of the labor force were, was still Chinese. So they are uh, a dominant, dominant working force and they were considered reliable, industrious, and they are less expensive. Well, um, bef so before Lock was built, Chinese also lived in uh, Water Grove, Ioton, and Cotton. And uh, in 1915, the, there was a fire in Water Grove, and a group of Chinese decided, oh, they will move, what, just as uh, one group, they moved from Lock, uh, from uh, Water Grove to Lock. They leased the land from George Lock, and uh, they built their own town. And it was considered the first Chinese town in the country. It's the first, town, first Chinese town that was built for the Chinese, by the Chinese, and later it was recognized and proclaimed as a national historical landmark because of that reason. And uh, he enjoyed the same uh, position as the Golden Gate Bridge. So you guys should really visit it. Do you have a question over there? Oh, I have a question. So behind Lock, like the town, is that why there's a bunch of ruins like by the, by the river? Like yes. The, like because of that fire? Sorry? <laughs> because of that fire, is that why there's like a bunch of ruins behind Lock? No, no. Uh, okay, the fire was in Warner Grove. Right. And uh, so when they moved to Lock and they, they, leased the, they built a the small town right next to the levee. Right. So uh, you are talking about the the snow grass sloop behind it, right? Yeah. So it's just there. I it's I mean we are surrounded by water anyway. Right? It's not by design that they want to be near water so that they get enough water to put out fire. Alright. Okay. If that's your question. Alright. And uh, um well before, before they built the, um, they built the lock, and uh, actually the Chinese had been here for, the Chinese had been there for 45 years. So there was a lot of experience, and uh, there's a lot of market. Therefore, they were able to turn a uh, lock in the, to an overnight success. And, um, the heyday of Locke, okay, from 1920s to 1950s, right? There are 600 permanent residents. There are 1,000 plus uh, seasonal workers. They they will stay in boarding house room throughout the town. And uh, um, Lock the town serve important basic needs of all the Chinese laborers, people in the Delta. Uh, they would come, go there for the butcher, the grocery, haircut, herbalist, and school, church, restaurants, you name it. And uh, the politicians and the government official from Sacramento, they also like to frequent Locke for their illegal entertainment establishment. Because they thought they came, they would go to lock, they would be, and they would go there anonymously, and they can enjoy all the vices without being uh, noticed. And um, all these um, establishments, they are vital to the lock economy. And these establishments include gambling house is always a, a good money spinner, and then you have the the brothel, the speakeasy, the open den. 
Well, um, in the 1950s, uh, then State Attorney General Edmund Brown, senior, um, he later became the governor. Well, he initiated a crusade to clean up all the illegal activities in law. So everything was stopped all at once. And that also marks the decline of luck because it coincides with the people in luck who are getting older, passing away. And thanks to the state, federal, favorable policy, they were given the opportunity to get an education, get a good job in the city, and get assimilated there. And so people are moving away, and also because like anywhere else in, big, in America, the big box retailer, they would take away the function of the small stores in the small town. Well, things to remember. Well, the Chinese contributed a major labor force that created the Delta Island and the levee system. And despite various discriminatory measures, they were able to thrive in the farming and canning industry. So they do relatively well economically. And Lok today is still a living community. So what I want to say to you is Lok is part of Delta and is also a heritage belongs to all of you, regardless of your ethnic background. And I suggest that you guys, you know, get involved and so you can take over some stewardship of Lok and other legacy towns in the Delta. I came from Hong Kong, and as you know, Hong Kong is basically Chinese people. But our police force, marching band, is bagpipes, the Scottish bagpipes. Why? Because we have the British legacy. So even today, Hong Kong is under the rule of China. The Scottish culture was in Hong Kong to stay. So that is that I'm trying to tell you that you know culture can be shared. All right? Now um, do I have any questions? Okay. Okay, so uh, before you go, I just want to show you that okay we have the Chinese New Year celebration I mentioned earlier. 16th of February, and come down and visit. Let we have programs like the SMP.